True growth happens from the bottom up, not the top down. All right, guys, welcome back to All or Nothing in Real Estate. Um, I'm your host, Matt Smith, founder of All or Nothing in Real Estate. Today, I am joined by the lovely Leah King. Leah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to share your journey with others and hear, hear part of your story. Um, you and I have been um, working together and, and um, networking for quite some time, and I've kind of admired you from afar, um, but I'm super excited to dive in and hear your story. Um, from what you're telling me, it's a pretty amazing story. So I'm excited to dive in and hear that today. Um, so let's, let's start with what does, what does your business look like today? So today I'm six years in the business. Um, I have, as you know, opened up one small boutique brokerage for two brokers that were not in Tampa. I reside in Tampa now, um, but they were not in Tampa, came to me, asked me to open a brokerage for them. And I did it. Um, during that time, I hired 10 agents. Um, I had their brokerage open for a year and four months. Um, we, we acquired 10 agents during that time. And then, you know, recently decided to make the switch over to EXP and open my own brokerage. So now I have my own brokerage. Um, all of those agents came with me. Um, we now have since then had a couple that decided to do other things, um, not real estate related. And so we're holding strong with seven agents right now. We have two agents that are getting licensed currently. Um, so we'll soon be, you know, back up to that nine number, but um, yeah. yeah. So that's what it looks like right now. I love it. So yeah, you recently <laughs> transitioned over EXP partnered with us and um, I'm super blessed to have you in our network. Um, you're super great fit for our culture and the culture of contribution and, and helping others, which is one of the reasons that we were able to have this interview today is I truly feel like contribution is the key in our industry and being able to contribute and share your story with others um, will hopefully, hopefully motivate, inspire, and help some others go through your journey. So um, I'm, I put a title here from agent to CEO. Um, and so that's a, that's, I know that's a kind of a, a clickbait title, but that's really what you've done. Um, it yeah. started out as a, as a single agent with a, a lot of work ethic and worked your way through and and so much so that you were kind of mentoring other agents very early on. Then you opened your uh, brokerage for somebody else. And then now you open your own. Um, so I'm really excited to unpack that and break that down um, today. So let's let's back let's back up. Let's start at the very, very beginning. Let's start at the Leah King story. Yeah. So I start I actually went to college to be a nurse. So I've always been um, in this mode of, of helping others and had that mindset. Um, went to college for a couple of years, got my bachelor's degree in nursing, worked in the medical field for six years. And then um, my family, I, in the meantime, I had three kids, one stepchild, so four total, um, got married and moved to Texas in the middle of getting my master's degree in nursing. I was studying holistic medicine. Um, I had one semester left, but we had this opportunity to come up in Texas and we just couldn't, I, as I thought about it, I was like, it's stupid to not take this opportunity. So stopped my nursing career, um, getting my master's degree and decided that we would move our family to Texas. Um, and that's how real estate happened for me. Cause when I got to Texas, I was looking into getting back in the, in the medical field and finishing my master's degree. And, um, I ended up running into a broker in this small town of Tyler, Texas, where we moved. Um, and he said, have you ever thought about getting a real estate license? And I was like, well, no, not really. I mean, my whole life has been about medicine, um, even from high school. Um, so I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And I was like, well, let me just come into your office and be an assistant and see what it looks like. Um, so went into his office as an ISA, actually. And I found out very quickly that I sucked as an ISA. So I thought, how in the world is this going to be <laughs> a good fit for me when I can't even schedule appointments for other people? But man, I got my real estate license and um, they had all hit their goals that year. And so my broker, the minute I became licensed, he took everybody on a cruise because they all hit their goals. And so just imagine you're in the office with just the front desk girl who does not have her license. So she doesn't know how to work the MLS. She doesn't know how to work the database. She doesn't know how to work Zillow. 
Um, and I was getting calls off the chain because we were just lead heavy. I was the only agent in the office and my broker came back and I had all these appointments on the board. I mean, I was so busy. I was running around like my hair was on fire and he's like, what did you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I was just taking calls. I couldn't even figure out how to use the MLS. I literally was looking at information off of Zillow and realtor.com because I could not figure out how to get into the MLS. And they were all on this cruise for a week. It was a seven day cruise. (laughs) So it was crazy. Um, but I got a lot of appointments and he came back and I wrote my very first contract. Um, he told me whenever I first, he was the greatest mentor ever. I just love him to pieces, but, um, he died last year of cancer, but when, he, before he left for the cruise, he said, you'll, you know, you shouldn't do owner financing. You probably never will. Um, we don't really sell properties under 150,000. Cause you know, it, it'll be more work than what it's ca- cut out for, but you do you, whatever you want to do. And, um, what was, Oh, commercial. He said, we, we focused on residential here. So you probably won't ever do commercial. Well, the very first contract I wrote was a church, a small church, uh, owner financing, and it was $72,000. And he came back from the cruise and the people were in the office and I was, I had written the contract, everybody signed. We were just going over some things. I had no idea what I was doing. (laughs) And he, I took the contract to him to look over it and he goes, that looks great. Now go back in there and write it on a commercial contract because I had written it on a residential contract. So crazy. That's hilarious. (laughs) That's that's crazy. So I've never heard that part of your story and maybe you've never heard this part of mine, but my training (laughs) when I started was somewhat similar minus the craziness with leads and things. Um, I, my very first day I got my license, I went in, I handed it to my broker at the time and said, well, here's my license. What do I do? He's like, uh, well, here's a contract, read it. I'm going on vacation. I'll be back in a week. Yeah. So, um, he came back from vacation and I had four contracts. I said, (laughs) I hope I filled these out right. What do I do? <laughs> um, so it's crazy. It's crazy how how similar some stories are. Um, I think one of the things that sticks out to me is that part of your story is that you were willing to start anywhere to see if it was a good fit and put in the work to earn your right for the opportunity to be an agent. Um, I mm-hmm. think there's a lot of people out there that in, have the entitled mindset or um, aren't willing to put in the work and you have to start somewhere. And if you put in the work, people notice it and you can escalate and scale your business um, and your success very quickly, like you have. Yeah. And I, you know, I think, um, going, I go back to that story all the time because I feel like if a lot of people will let fear, you know, I, I did not know how to do anything. I didn't even know how to use the database. I went home every single night after my day of work of going into the office when it was crazy like that and just logged into the, we had Boomtown at the time, logged into Boomtown and just clicked on every single button that I could, because I was just trying to furiously like figure it all out because I knew the next day I was going in the office and more leads were going to be funneling in. And, you know, I knew that that was my opportunity. Um, and that I had to learn the systems really quickly. Once he got back from the cruise, I figured out how to use the MLS, but you know, in the meantime, I had Zillow. So I was like, Oh, I can do this, you know, but I just, I feel like a lot of people will let fear or the fear of not knowing get in their way. And you in real estate, you just can't, I mean, this is an ever changing um, career. I mean, we, every single day I learn stuff St- still, I'm like, Oh my God, I didn't know that, you know? So it, you awesome. just can't let it. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people let fear turn into <laughs> panic and, yeah. and or overwhelm. And whenever mm-hmm. you're in overwhelm or panic mode, what do we do as human beings? We freeze and when you yeah. freeze, nothing productive happens. And so, mm-hmm. um, it's, I call it trial by fire. Like you, so my coach, John Sheplak says the real education doesn't happen in the classroom. It happens on yeah. the field. In the field. Because learning is only half the battle. Applying what you learn is the magic. And right. too many people get stuck in that <laughs> cycle and they want to analyze everything. And I need to know everything before I can do anything. The best way to learn is by doing. And so yeah. you're absolutely right. There's so much, there's so many new things in this business that we all learn every single day. Um, number one, be humble to realize you don't know it all, which Leah is. Um, and number two, just be willing to fail. Like mm-hmm. that's how you learn. A failure is a learning lesson. And so you won't know if you don't try it. And so move forward, figure it out as you go. And great action always leads to success. Yeah. I mean, you and I just had this conversation last week because I'm trying to now switch from a, a sales agent mind set to a business owner mindset where I have agents to feed and that are relying on me and a company to build. And you told me last week, get get your three things to focus on 
And that's how you did it. You focused on your three things once, you know, that month, this is what we focus on next month. We move on to the next three things, but I do, I overwhelm myself all the time because I'm trying to do it all. And I want to do it right now. And I want to have it all perfect. And, um, but that's not how a great business is built. And that's one of the things that I've learned from you. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. And that's so true. And I still struggle with it too, is because I'm a visionary. I'm an idea guy. Like I I thought of four new ideas this morning, you know, like (laughs) things I want to try. Um, But it's, it, the ideas are useless without implementation. And so Mm -hmm. what happens, so you can use this at any level in real estate. So you can use that as a single agent, a brand new agent, a veteran agent, a team leader, a broker owner, We all have so many things that we can improve and or change on a daily basis. Yeah. But you can't do it all at once. You become a jack of all trades and a master of none. And you are half-assing so many different things, you don't get the result that you should get. And you're not able to help as many clients, as many agents, et cetera, your community as well as you could, because you're not, you're not focusing on certain things that are going to move the needle today. And so- Um, it's, and because we all, I've learned this being around top producers like you, Leah, throughout the industry is that, um, we all like from the outside, people think we have it all figured out, but we don't Yeah. We walk around all day, every day with our hair on fire. We think everything's going to explode, but we're willing to fix it. <laughs> we're willing, we're willing to put in the work and focus on the things that are either the biggest fire or the most important and urgent and fix that one thing and then move to the next. Yeah. And, it's um, it's crazy the mindset of the people that are the elite that are actually doing big things. I had a um, another friend on um, the number one team in California, my man Sunit, and he said, it is my goal every day to break stuff. He's like, I try to break shit in my organization on a daily basis because if I break it, guess what? I get to fix it and improve it. Mm-hmm. And that's the mindset that it takes to be successful in this business. You're never going to have it all figured out. Just do something and do it very, very well. And once you master that skill, add in something else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what we're working on. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait until it's more, a little bit more seamless, but it's, you know, it's fun while you're doing it though. I mean, I'm learning a lot. Enjoy so. the journey because yeah. um, a lot of people think that, oh, well, as we're building, as we're building, it's going to get easier. It's going to get better. There are moments where it does, but there are also moments where now your problems are just 10 times as big of problems. Yeah. And now you don't have one system. You have 10 systems that are failing at once. And so it's just, it's enjoy the journey is my point, because that's, yeah. that's stuff you'll look back on and really, really enjoy. Um, so yeah, guys, if you're listening to this, here's some actionable takeaways is whatever is important in your business, find, find the three to five things that are the most important for this quarter. That what are the three to five things that are going to move the needle for my organization this quarter? Make sure they're specific and actionable and focus on those. Anything else can wait till the next quarter. You still have to do your day-to-day stuff. Don't get me wrong. But if it's a project, something new, a new CRM, a new technology, whatever it may be, find three to five that are the most important and master those. And then next quarter, you can add in more. Yeah, it definitely cool. helps. Yeah, <laughs> let's, get, let's get back to your journey. So, okay. um you have you now have a um, your own team in Tampa. Um, actually, I want to go back. Let's go back even further. So let's go back to your very first year in, in real estate. How many um, did you start off very successful in the business? What does that look like? Um, I mean, yeah, because I think because of the situation that I was in in the very beginning. Well, I told you I started as an ISA. I really sucked as as an ISA. I really did. I didn't do good scheduling appointments for other people. But the minute that I was able to schedule appointments for myself, um, I did very well. Um, sold 40 transactions my very first year. Um, my first month selling real estate was February. So as you know, from February till about March, I didn't sell anything because it takes about 30 days to get the, you know, the ball rolling. So Um, basically in your first three quarters in real estate, you sold 40 homes. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. I hit the ground running hard and it was all over the place. It wasn't, you know, I, I did just do residential after my first, you know, commercial (laughs) sale. Um, It was all residential and I, I did not have any listings. Um, it was all by, it was all buyers because we were separated as buyers agents and listing agents. And on our team, it was kind of like a promotion to get promoted up to the listing side. Cause they're, that's where, you know, your bread and butter is you produce leads off of them too. So anyways, I was a buyer's agent. Um, so 40, 40 transactions, all, all buyers that I worked with, um, 
And my first three months when my broker came back, you know, he realized, I think really quick that um, I was going to get burned out. And he came to me and he said, we need to get you a showing assistant because you are going to burn yourself out. And I was so against it. I didn't want to spend a dollar paying somebody else to, you know, go out there, show homes, pros- whatever. I just didn't want to, didn't want to spend a dollar because I was loving the amount of money that I was making. And I didn't want to hand the baton over to anybody else to mess it up or whatever. It was just a Let me guess. Thing. Did you have this, the talk with him? Well, nobody can do it as good as me. I, you know, I don't remember exactly what the conversation looked like. I think it was more of, I don't want to let that go out of my paycheck. I wanted, but I did at the time I didn't realize, you know, that this is probably why I sold 40 homes my first year, because once I, about a month after I started feeling that burnout and I was like, okay, yeah, maybe he's right. Like I'm, I'm spinning the wheel. I had kids at home that were also involved in sports and I wanted to free up some more of my time in the evening and on the weekends. Cause I was, I think at that time, you know, my husband was like, you you know, we're going to have issues because I was working every weekend. Um, and, but the kids were somehow all still getting fed and making it to where they were supposed to go. But I can tell you that there were a lot of times I was cooking dinner in the kitchen and I was writing contracts or looking up properties or, you know, it just was, it was a mess. So about a month after he had that conversation with me, we hired a full-time showing assistant for our company. Um, I worked at at Remax at the time, but that showing assistant, um, I ended up splitting it with another agent. And honestly, it created some healthy competition too with both of us. We both of us had great years that year. And I think because we were like, who can keep Skylar the busiest longer, you know? And, and I would try to, to book him before, you know, my, my, uh, one of my agent partners name was James, but I would try to book him before he could get Skylar on Saturday. Right. But you can't book him unless you actually have showing. So we'd be on the phone, like who can we call to get showing <laughs> scheduled so I can tie Skylar up for Saturday. But, um, so we did that. We split him for a couple of months until about two, three months later, I just, I needed Skylar full-time and James didn't want to, he didn't want to do full-time with them. So I ended up hiring, I sat down with Skylar and my broker and ended up hiring him full-time. And he, he was mine for, you know, a year, year and a half. And today Skylar is selling between 40 and 50 homes a year. He just became an independent agent like last year. Um, not, I'm sorry, year before last, but he's killing it. He's a good kid. He's doing really good. But anyway, so I, I, um, started working with Skylar part-time and, Um, it freed up some of my time. And then I had started training some of the newer agents that came in our office. So I'm about five, six months in helping other agents do what I've been doing in the last, you know, six months. Um, and we also that year, um, started an ISA program, um, where at that time we had hired about four ISAs and remember I sucked in the beginning. (laughs) but I figured it out real quick once I could schedule them for myself. And so I started training our ISA department, um, scheduling appointments and stuff. It was a lot easier after I learned how to actually schedule appointments, Sure, (laughs) but I want to break, I want to break that down. So I asked that question on, um, on your showing assistant, because I run into a lot of people. So I'm both on my personal team and other people I coach and other people I talk to in our network and stuff is, um, leverage is so, so important in this business. And yeah. so, I mean, as an example, if you run a team model, your team model creates leverage for everybody on the team. Like you yeah. have specialists in each field, right? It's that's so um, it's it's very, very difficult to get into agents heads sometimes mm-hmm. to let them understand the importance. If they are a busy agent, the leverage that you create by having that showing assistant, showing partner, it is huge. And it allows you to focus on other things that are higher, higher dollar producing activities to you or maybe things that you are you are better at. And so there's two reasons that I see people struggle with that. And number one, you you hit on, which was the financial part, because it is an investment, right? And number two is a lot of people get in the mindset and they get in their own way. Well, they're not, they don't know how I show properties and they're not going to show them the way that I would. Um, and so <laughs> just get out of your own way because that investment and that leverage and that training that you can do with that individual 
will absolutely set you free and help you take your next step in your business, whatever that looks like for you. And so it may not be a showing partner for whoever's listening to this, but there's so many different aspects, whether it's a virtual assistant, whether it's an ISA department, whether it's marketing help, there are so many leveraged tools that you can create in this business that will absolutely help you free up your time because your time is your most precious asset. You ask any top producer in the industry, what is more important, time or money? Without hesitation, all of them want more time. Yeah. Right? Because we have we have figured out how to create more money. We just don't know how to get our time back. And so listening to these hacks and learning from what Leah went through is she also hit on that is that that created more time for her so she could spend more time with her family. She could go to the sports games. And that was probably that's there's a reason she mentioned that versus the money she gave up because that's what stood out to her because she that was way more important to her than that $500 that transaction or whatever it was that you have to pay that showing partner because you were able to be present with your family. Right. Yeah. I think that's why the following year, you know, I, I told you before the call, but I was on track to sell 60 homes that year before I moved to Tampa. Um, and that's the only reason why I was able to do that is because I had Skylar helping me. So hundred percent. And you also mentioned something else too, that <laughs> I love, um, is healthy competition. Mm -hmm. So break us down a little bit about your, your story, your journey of healthy competition, what that looked like, and maybe what that looks like today in your organization. Yeah, so we had this this TV on the outside of our um, offices in Tampa. I'm sorry, in Tyler, Texas, and it displayed our goal and it displayed all of our our units and our volume that we were selling. And me and a lot of the agents, but me and James in particular, and I still talk to him today. He has his own team in Tyler, Texas now too. But um, we used to stand outside in that hallway and look at that board and both of us would just be like this. I mean, just trying to figure out because we were just neck and neck all, you know, and, and I'd be like, I, I, you know, I'd be one under him or he'd be one under me and we'd be like, dang it, you know, cause we would compete every single month. And, um, but it was, it was like that for a lot of us. And, and now we don't have that so much at this time, but we are working towards that. Um, we're starting to, to, um, do some, um, competition stuff. Like, uh, we're doing challenges. You know, we have a challenge right now where Wednesday started day zero. I had everybody put on their calendar day zero. We came into our, our Wednesday morning meeting last week. And I said, everybody put day zero on your calendar right now, because on December 31st, we're going to look at our numbers and see where we're at. And whoever is my top producer for, um, for now until December 31st, I bought an extra Cabo ticket. So they'll get an extra Cabo in their room paid for when we do our EXP event um, in Cabo, Mexico um, yeah. for March. And then the second person in line will get, you know, a gift card to probably somewhere nice. And, and then our third person. So we're starting to create that in our office. We're going to start doing like a spin wheel um, and, and do stuff like that. So I think that's what creates the, the healthy competition in your office. Um, and it keeps people eager to do good. Not only it's not even self-satisfying to me, but I want everybody to do what they want to do too, which is another thing that I learned from you, which is why we can't force people to be successful is because they have to want it too. And some people, you know, they're okay with selling 12 homes a year. Um, but in order for you to be on a high producing team, you have to, you know, I mean, there, there's expectations there. Um, but I think that when you have leaders within your company, they see people producing at such a high level. Like I know my, my team members see me producing and they're like, Oh shit, she can do it. I can do it. You know? So they'll step their game up a little bit. And that's kind of what our competition is right now. We turn our, our numbers in every single Friday. If I have more numbers on the board, they're like, Oh my God, if Leah can do it, I can do it. So then they start making you know, X amount of dials, I start seeing their numbers go up too. Um, so that that's what we're creating now. But I think that's, that's what you have to have in your organization is the challenges. Um, because people also, especially like you're high on the disc profile, your high eyes, um, they love to see they'll, they'll look at their achievements more than they will the money coming in just because oh. that's what that's what drives them, you know, so um, that's a percent. That's so yeah. crucial. So many leaders make the mistake. They think everybody's motivated by money. Yeah. And it's a lot not of people <laughs> are not motivated by money. They're motivated I'll dangle by a cruise. Yeah. Yep. If I dangle a cruise, my high eyes, which are all your salespeople pretty much yep. are going to be like, oh, a cruise? I'm down. <laughs> I'm going to get that cruise. You they know? don't realize <laughs> that that challenge is going to make them tens of thousands more dollars that they could have paid yeah. for that cruise 10x, but they want to go on that cruise. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah. So for yeah. your like high I, high D people, you know, for them, you have to break it down. You make this amount of phone calls, you schedule this amount of appointments. This is how many deals you expect. And then by the end of this challenge, you'll have $60,000 in your pocket. Those are your, your like high D, high I people, right? So, yeah. so we run it both ways. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, um, that I'm going to tie competition. So we have, we have a ton of competition in our team. We are very transparent with each other. Um, and so we go over our numbers weekly. Um, and it's, it's a healthy competition. I truly believe that what, what you said is so true. Somebody doing something great in your organization inspires and motivates somebody else that it's possible. It gives mm -hmm. them, that goal. it gives them that extra motivation. Um, and so there are some people that are, that say they're not competitive and, they're just, they're motivated by different things, right? Ultimately you have to, part of being a leader is adjusting to who you're talking to and making sure you're, you're having the right conversations. Like you said, different personality types are motivated by different things. But one of the things that I want to break down is healthy competition. We can tie that in with focus. And so you mentioned a competition between now and the end of the year. I love it. Mm -hmm. You can do quarterly competitions. You can do monthly competitions, weekly competitions, daily competitions, now, of course, you're not going to give away a cruise or, or a Cabo ticket every day. But right. what if, what if, so let's go back to the focus. We, we want to, as real estate agents, we want to sell more houses. But when's the last time you actually dove into your business and figured out where the biggest hole is that you can fill that will lead to selling more houses? Whether it's more action you take, whether it's a, right now, ours is we're focusing on appointments met. That's a gap that we realize is that we are setting a lot of appointments, but our met ratio is not where it needs to be. And so if we meet with more people face to face, we're going to ultimately be able to help more people and get more closings. So we are doing a competition this month around appointments met, and I'm giving away ExpCon ticket to the winner of that. Whoever meets the most people is coming to ExpCon with me. Right. right. So um, you can do that on a larger scale, like Leah and I just mentioned, or you can do that on a daily scale. We have a call night tonight. As an example, we're going to yeah. run a competition every hour on the most dials, <laughs> most hangups, most conversations, whatever it is to make it fun. And then they get to spin the wheel and the wheel goes around. You get a hundred dollars. You get you get me being able to call five leads for you. There's so many different things that you can do um during during competitions that really create that that healthy environment that people want to do more and it's so so crucial that you tie that competition into what's important to your focus right now yeah no i agree with that and um i think that you have that's one thing we were missing in in our brokerage is we weren't really doing that and our numbers were they were telling it now that we've created this people are prospecting and and I think it helps people right now, especially pull them out of the the crazy COVID market that we just had. And, and it puts that work ethic or at least guides them to um, do the things that is necessary for them to be able to still produce at the level that they were through crazy COVID. Well, how many agents in this world don't know what they need to do to be successful? Nobody's yeah. broken down the numbers for them. Yeah. So that's the responsibility of the leader to do that, to give them that path. The path is in the math, right? It's all math if you break it down. Um, yeah. Of course, there's strategies. There's there's a lot of nuances to that. But ultimately, we have our business running. And I know you're on the path to doing that is I know how many dials it takes to make you have a conversation. I know how many right. conversations it takes to equal a closing, right? Like what is in everywhere in between? And if you can have that data and that information, you can actually coach and help your agents reach their goals. Because a lot of people do it real estate on accident. We do real estate on purpose. Right. We act with intent so that we can reach our goals and our commitments so that we can help as many people as we can. And yeah. you track this stuff and you create competitions and fun around it with cool prizes and um, keep people energized. It makes a huge, huge difference. Yep. 100% agree. Let's get, let's get back to your story. So okay. You've been in the business for how long now? Six years? Six years. Mm -hmm. So you were in Tyler, Texas. You were on pace for um, 60 units your second year, and then you decided to move? Um, so I went through some life stuff because that's what life does, throws life balls at us. Yep. So did that. And uh, I moved to Tampa, Florida, started with another company that was designed just like the one that I worked at in um, Tyler, Texas. And um, I just quickly figured out that I felt like I could just do it on my own. Um, I, 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 not to go into it too much, but it just wasn't a good fit for me. Sure. Um, so I ended up going to another company, um, here where I was an independent agent and 
I didn't know anybody in Tampa. Didn't I, my parents are three and a half hours away on the, on the East coast of Florida. I'm on the West coast. Um, you know, I have babies. I be, began living life as a single mom. I didn't know babysitters. I still had to Google getting to Walmart, um, from my front door. So I didn't know how to get anywhere or do anything, but still managed to sell 30 homes. Um, my first year in the business in Tampa. Um, and then, you know, my second year I was opening a brokerage for two brokers in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, let's slow down a little bit. You yeah. just said a lot. So I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to recap this for the listeners here. Her very first year in real estate, she started in February. She sold 40 houses on her second year. She was on pace to do 60. She moves to a completely new area. She knows nobody, doesn't even know where Walmart is, and sells 30 homes her first year in a brand new area. Leah, that's that's a tremendous story. <laughs> I asked all my coaching clients this. I've never asked you this, so I'm anxious yeah. to answer it myself. What do you, I, I'm a firm believer that everybody has a superpower. Yeah. What do you feel like your superpower is that has helped you accomplish all of that? So I'm really big on, on building, um, relationships. Um, and that's one thing that I can say that if you're not working on building relationships in this business, you're missing out big time. That's the one thing that really helped me with, with my business. And I 100% believe that had I not had the relationships or started building those very early, early on, my business would not have taken off the way that it has in Tampa, Florida, because when I started at that other brokerage, that was not a good fit for me. Um, I met one person and that one person, um, was just getting into the business of, um, mortgage. Um, and we both kind of leaned on each other for, and that's weird to say, because you don't want to necessarily work with somebody brand new in the business and I'm brand new in the business, but sure. it, it, it jived for us. Um, and I'm actually this office that I'm in right now, is with that partner that I met years ago. I work in here rent free. He, you know, is pretty much allowing us to have the space that that we have, and we still have a great partnership. He now has a team. My agents use his lenders, and so that's the power of like what building relationships has done for me. Like the reason I was able to open a brokerage my second year in the business was because of that relationship with him. So there's just been doors that have just continued to be open. So what happened is. I met him and I went on my own and he said, Hey, let's start buying leads together. Well, I didn't know any, you know, I, I was still trying to figure out who was who in the world of Tampa, Florida. And we started doing that. And just immediately, I, I mean, I started working alongside of him in the office and we just started churning them, churning them, churning them. And he was doing the the loans and I was doing, you know, the, the buyers, um, and after that, the second year, I opened the, the brokerage with his partner that's in Columbus, Ohio, that wanted to have a brokerage here in Tampa, Florida. And he's like, oh, you got to meet my, you got to meet this girl, Leah, you know, that she wants to have a team, you know, that's something that she's working towards. Um, and that's how that door was open. So through that relationship, I was able to sell 30 houses my first year. He was able to get his, you know, jumpstart his business. And now he has a team. Both of us had a team by year two. Yeah. Um, and I would just say, you know, that people that don't focus on working professionally and building those relationships in real estate, that's where you, that's where you're lacking in your business. Yeah. 100%. That's one of our core values is for that exact reason is that there's this business can be very cutthroat and it doesn't, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Have to be. You can build those relationships with your, um, your co-broke agent, with the competition, with lenders, with the vendors, a hundred percent, because you never know when that will serve you again. Yeah. Um, and it's just the right thing to do, right? Just be a good person and good things happen. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, so 30, 30 homes your first year in Tampa, then you start a team um, and you, how quickly did you get up to 10 agents on that team? So we were up to 10 agents, I think within six months. Wow. Um, I had 10 agents and, um, and they were, for the most part, most of them were at a place in their business where they could produce, they could produce if they had the tools to be able to do it, the CRM, the leads, you know, that I was able to provide them and going back to relationships. And sure. with, with the tools that they had, when they started with me, a lot of them just took off. Um, they had some of the best years that they've ever had in their, in their business. And I think I told you before the call, um, they're still with me. 
minus like four of them because they did other things outside of real estate. They wanted to go do other things outside of real estate. Well, I think that speaks to the volume of leader and character that you are um, for leading them down the right path. And I know making a transition to a new brokerage is not easy. Um, And so um, for them to stay and not only stay, but I remember one of our conversations um, when you were making the transition is that one of your agents basically took the lead on it and said, here, I'll do this first and kind Mm -hmm. of went through the path to kind of help the team. And not only does that so a lot of people would say, hey, well, she's got great people. And absolutely, I've had the privilege to meet a couple of them when we were in Dallas. Um, and I know for a fact you have great people, but where people don't give enough credit, in my opinion, is that good people only follow good leaders. Mm-hmm. And so um, mm-hmm. kudos to you, Leah, for being that person and that that leader for those for the people that are following you in your, in your company, and your team, because there's there's a lack of leadership in this world, especially in this space. Um, mm-hmm. And so we need more good leaders like you. Yeah, so, they they all made the switch with me. And one of the things when we did make the switch, and I feel like this is where a lot of leaders, at least that I've been around to lack um, also is we, you want to build a company that everybody wants, wants to work with it. And yes, you have to put examples in place and expectations in place. But at the same time, I know that this, that we are building here in Tampa, Florida, you know, our brokerage would not be where it is right now if I didn't have certain people that I've delegated and I just started doing this. And recently as of, you know, Dallas, Texas, when we went to the the conference, um, you know, we've, we've put in place our chief fund officer because that is not, I'm not good at creating these challenges and these, you know, the healthy competition, but you need it. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we delegated one person for that. And as you know, Chad, um, my one agent partner, um, he's helping me tremendously just get systems in place and, and, you know, implementing new things in our, in our brokerage. So I'm, I definitely, I'm not a one woman show. They all contribute. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's, and that's how you grow something, right. Is, um, let's talk about where a lot of leaders fail. We could be, we could do three podcasts on this, but, um, <laughs> is there's a lot of people that think, well, it needs to be my idea and I need to be the one that creates it. Um, and I, I would argue that that is the worst situation for a leader. The best situation is somebody else on your team feels empowered to come to you with an idea or suggestion, and they, you empower them to take the lead on that, and then you have the final say-so, because now they have buy-in, and they are going to follow that system and get other people to follow that system that whatever it is that they're working on that will really help transform your business, because True growth happens from the bottom up, not the top down. Right. What are you doing as a leader to empower your people who are in the trenches that have great talents that hopefully um, highlight some of your weaknesses? What are you doing to empower them to take control of that and help your business grow? Because ultimately, it's not Leah's business. My team isn't my business. It's our business. And what are we doing collectively to improve it? Right. And so I think that's that's kind of a highlight of what you just said is that don't be afraid to delegate because we all have everybody has a superpower. Everybody is great at something. What is their superpower and how can that contribute to the team? Most people don't contribute to their environment and the team because they don't feel like they can. They don't have the safety or they feel like, well, if I contribute, that's just going to add to my workload. Right. Like you have to find that balance of rewarding them and wanting their opinion and their feedback to help the company grow. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, well, I mean, we have meetings every single week and yes, I'm the team leader, but I I really try to um, encourage everybody on our team. If you have something to bring to the table, you're scheduled for that Wednesday meeting to talk. You bring it to the table, you train on it. If you figure out how to use something really well, well, I mean, I've done training, you know, we use our, our CRM as follow-up boss, but um, we have had agents on our team train on follow up boss because they're utilizing it very well. And yep. I want everybody else to know so that we really do encourage that in our brokerage. And I could, I could do a whole podcast on just that and how that's important and crucial to an organization. Um, those of you listening, I want you to rewind and listen to that part. What are you doing to empower your people to train others on something that they are excelling at? 
yeah. that does so much to your organization. It puts them on a pedestal. Other people pay attention. It's on and on. It's a it's a domino effect of so many great things to organizations. But most people think, no, I'm the leader. I need to teach it. People are tired of hearing us talk, right? <laughs> So we need to highlight other voices and we need to have other people lift them up because honestly, they probably know tips and tricks that we don't because they're utilizing it every day on a different level than we are. Right. Yep. 100%. Cool. Now let's talk about your transition from that team. Um, I know you had some pain points. Do you want to hit on any of those pain points with that other organization or do you want to skip that? Uh, I, no, I mean, I think it's fine not to like puke EXP, but you know, my journey um, throughout this process, um, I went back and forth a long time with even even when I was opening the other brokerage, I thought in my mind, if I can learn everything I need to know about EXP, just because I, I saw that it was a great company coming to fruition, I knew that it was going to grow and expand. I didn't know everything about it at the time, but I thought, well, maybe if I can learn enough about it, because that was really the direction that I kept feeling pulled. And, and you know, I start I really felt that I needed to go in that direction. I just sure. didn't know about it enough. Um, and I thought if I could grow the other brokerage to a certain level, maybe I could have that conversation. It would open the door for me to have that conversation with the, with my partners. Um, and maybe it would be something that we could do together. Um, but at the end of the day, after I had done my research on EXP Realty and decided that that was the direction I really wanted to go, um, unfortunately it was explained in a negative way to the people that I was in business with and they just weren't interested. Um, I just saw the level that it could expand and grow to. And that's what we're starting to do right now. And it's really exciting to see because I had this vision in my mind that that's what would happen. Um, and I just didn't know that, you know, I just didn't know how fast it would happen. And um, and that really it would bring everything that it has, has brought to me. So just to touch on it a little bit, when we were at the other brokerage, it was small boutique brokerage, no name brokerage. Um, which I was a little nervous about, but it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If you're lead heavy and you have the right people in place working leads, it doesn't really matter about the name so much. People work with people, not brands. Exactly. Um, which I never got in my own way with that. I opened the brokerage knowing that if we had the right people in place, working the leads the way that they needed to be worked and having the customer service that that we needed to have, it would be fine. Um, so I never focused on that too much. Um, and then the one thing I will say that we did not have that we do now is the support. Like EXP has an amazing support system um, through the people that are involved in the organization, but also in the, you know, behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, anything that we need help with, um, it's there. And that is amazing. I mean, it, if we need extra training, it's all there. If we need people for whatever, whatever it is, all we have to do is ask for it. And I get an email or a text message or a call same day. And I know exactly where to go. I don't feel lost or I just, I don't feel like I do, I'm doing it all by myself and I have nowhere to go. Yeah. Um, so I love that. I, lo I love that about our transition so far. My agents love that about our transition so far. We've, we've in the very beginning needed a lot of help and through EXP's behind the scenes, we were able to get all the help that we needed. And, and, and still I, I reached out to, you know, the transactions department last week and whatever. So I love having that. Yeah. It's, it's one of the big myths about EXP, right? Is a lot of people say, well, it's a cloud brokerage and they have all this crazy stuff and there's no support. But my experience is just like yours. It's, a, it's the exact opposite. Because how the model is ran, you have more support than you would ever get with any other company. And most importantly, let's break this down for agent terms. Agents, the team model is so popular for a reason because it allows you to be specialist in certain areas that you're good at and have tunnel vision on that. EXP has done that for the behind the scenes of their company, of the of the cloud brokerage, is they have transactions department, they have agent services, they have marketing, they have tech, they have accounting, they have all those that are specialists in that field. So you're not going to one person to try to be the answer to all your questions. You're going to a specialist in that field that can help you with whatever your problem, question, concern may be. Yep. Yep. And I've used a lot of the different departments. <laughs> yeah. 
um, with great results. Um, so that, but then also one of my biggest fears in real estate, only because I saw it with some of the other companies that I, that I worked with, um, along the way. And I, I haven't worked with a lot, but through the other companies that I worked with, I realized it retention is always a big, a big problem. Um, and I love my people and pour into my people so much and want everybody to do good. But I also want to keep them with me, like figure out how to keep them with me because yep. you are pouring into them. And if there is a problem, you know, let's fix it. Don't, don't leave me. You know, I, I love my people. So that was always like a fear of mine is getting people in the door and then they leave me. And I'm like, how do I, how do I keep that from, and luckily it has not happened and I'm so thankful. Um, but what I started hearing through my leaders that I hired on the no name boutique brokerage is that they also wanted teams. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to train them and they're going to do great things. And then they're going to leave me to go build their team. Um, and so I, I started thinking, how can we do this together? Um, and EXP solved my problem. So now I have leaders on my team that want to that's, that's her dream. They want to have teams too. But now what the conversation that we're having is totally different because they're like, Leah, I don't want to do it without you. And I'm like, well, I want to do it with you. You know, we have a vested interest together now. And now I'm like, okay, well, let's put a plan in place for, you know, maybe we open a brokerage here and that's yours. That's your baby. This is my baby. I have this going over here. I'm going to help you do that. Yep. Um, but I also have somebody that reached out to me. I told you from Orlando and, and they're working on things right now. Um, and also Sarasota where I'm still, you know, babying something over in Sarasota, Florida. Both of those markets are huge markets, but they're in two totally different areas, about an hour, hour and a half away. Um, and they've said the same thing. Like, I don't, you know, I want to be able to do it under your mentorship and guidance. And I'm like, great. I've, you know, I have a vested interest in your company. I want you to do good. Yeah. Let's do it together. Um, you know, and so I can pick up, places where I know that they're going to, they're going to lack or need help with. Um, and just like we've already talked about the contributing goes back and forth. So there's going to be things that they help me with that. I, I don't even know that I need help with yet, you know? And so that's the, that really for me has been the biggest, um, change, um, life-changing experience with moving our brokerages. Now I know that, that people aren't, you know, if, as long as, you know, I can give them what they need, they're not going to leave me. So and we're going to be, grow, you know, growing just teams in other areas and, and whatnot. So, yeah. And, and again, this isn't a, um, a, like Leah said, this isn't an EXP pitch fest, but it's, it's true. Um, it's so I remember when I made the decision to join EXP, I had the vision of if I join this company, is it best for me? The answer was yes. The most important question after that was, is it best for my agents? Yep. Because there was a lot of options I could make work for me. But what about my agents? Not only for the retention aspect, but also my agents are owners in EXP. My owners, my agents have stock that they get. For every transaction they close, they get a, they get stock at a discount, right? They get to buy into this great company. Um, when they do something great, the company rewards them with free stock. They have the opportunity to have revenue share. They recruit somebody to the team and have, which they do all the time. They have their friends want to be in real estate. Well, they join our team and then they get revenue from them. And it just creates that camaraderie and it, EXP created something that I couldn't create without it. And it created opportunities for my agents that would not exist if it wasn't for this great company. And so anybody that's maybe thinking about it, like, again, this isn't an EXP pitch fest. I just highly recommend that you look into it in depth and think about the bigger picture. There is so much opportunity, not only to sell more houses. I mean, my team's going to sell 850 plus homes this year. Um, and so like, there's a lot of big producers within EXP that you won't hear about that from the naysayers, right? But there's a lot of big producers that can help you produce, that can help you create your team, that can help you in your transition, that can give you coaching, that can give you marketing help, that can give you whatever support that you need and guidance so that you can reach whatever goals that you want. Because that's the power of us all being in the same company and rowing in the same direction, is that we truly are in this together, helping each other. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it makes a big, big difference. And I've been with other brokerages. It's not like that. Yeah. I mean, it just isn't. So this has been great. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, we're almost out of time here. Um, is there anything you want to wrap up your story? Anything you want to close with? 
I don't think so. I mean, I, I would just say that, you know, anybody that is working in the um, real estate business now that is struggling or needs help with something just to reach out because there are people like you and I that, that will help people, you know, get them in the right direction, get them where, where their business is thriving. Um, anything that we can do to help, you know, I'm, I'm here for it. So if anybody wants to reach out to me and just ask me questions or, or figure out, you know, how I've, done what I've done or corrected things that I wish I would have done differently in the beginning that I'm doing now, just reach out because I'm an open book. I'm always here to answer any questions. I love it. So um, where would you like for people to reach out to you? You want to share some of your social platforms or where do you, where do you want people to reach out to you at? Yeah. So people can find me on Instagram at Leah.King underscore, underscore Tampa dot realtor. Sorry. And then on Facebook, I'm, I'm just Leah King. Um, and then I also have the Leah King group as well. So you can reach out there. Awesome. Well, Leah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your contributions. Um, it's been a great episode and uh, had a great time. So thanks for having, thanks for being here.